So let's pray, and we'll get into it. So Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are, consuming fire. In all glory, Lord, you sit there on your throne, and we can only bow before you and put our faces down on the floor and pray, Lord, that that power that exists that you offer to us, that we receive it. So, Lord, forgive us of our sins because, Lord, we know that if we're an unclean vessel, Lord, this can't happen. So clean us, Lord, that we can receive from you tonight, from your word, because it's your word that gives us life and it's your word that gives us direction in these last days. And so, Lord, I just pray that we'd receive that now. Clear our minds of all the garbage, of all the junk, all the nonsense, and let us be built up as strong Christian men tonight through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this reading is filled with a lot of different things. And I want to read through it and then kind of reflect on some things. So 1 Samuel chapter 31, <coughs> verse 1. And again, before we get it, it picks up right after, as if we were just reading it. You know, we just have this little space in between of chapters 29. And, and then all of a sudden we get right back into where Saul was. And it says, now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Starts off this chapter by telling us exactly what's going down here. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle was sore against Saul. And the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. And then said Saul unto his arm bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his arm bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon him. And when his arm bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his arm bearer and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. We just read the death of the king. Now, to live through something like that is a huge thing, major event. And it's really weird, man, when you read passages of scripture like this, because it's like we're just like when you read the passages of scripture that refer to Jesus and and the resurrection, you just read through these major events. And we're just, we just read through a, ve a very major event. Saul, who we all know as the first king of Israel, anointed by God, his sons, we know Jonathan and his relationship that he had with David. We know that he was the prince, man, a real humble dude, one that was right on track, one that knew God's plan. And we just read the death of these men. Their lives are done, man. And I think sometimes when you start to reflect on life and death, you start to get involved in like, what consists of our lives? What consists of a man's life? You know, what consists of the series of events that take place in our life that lead to certain points of, of the finish, of the end? Every single one of us in this room are going to have an end. The other, the other day I was talking about... Uh, about creation. And I was talking about how it's really neat to see God in the beginning, how he just created. He created out of an Eve, man. And he created them, these perfect beings. And then we as readers get to read the scripture and say, and watch the series of events that polluted that perfection. And we get to watch Satan and all his devices and everything that he conjured up and destroy that perfection in Adam and Eve. And then we get to sit back and watch the change of of the earth and the change of God when he says, I'm going to destroy what I created because I'm grieved over this man. And we get to watch these series of events in the scripture's life and just observe how it's something very common that takes place in the Bible. God ordains, God anoints, God creates. And in the middle of life comes this intervening, most often deceptive poison of the enemy. Satan's objective is very simple. It's to ruin and destroy what God has created. It's to ruin and destroy what God has made holy. 
That's his objective. And if he can end a life in that same fashion, then what is it? What, what, is, what do we see Satan's key, his objective, his success? I know a lot of guys, and I know a lot of you guys too, who are today not walking with the Lord. Guys who have turned away, who started in the spirit. Guys who have been made set free. People who raised their hand just this, almost the same day we did. And through life, we've watched the enemy enter in their minds and in the things of their life and bring them to a place of destruction. We've seen marriages fall apart. I hate to always talk about that, but it's just the reality of where we're at. Marriages have fallen apart. You know, family members who just got all hooked on drugs and they're not even the same person anymore. They you don't even know them. Then people end up losing their minds. We've watched... What God, I, I, I pictured, I, I was teaching this at this purity thing, and I might mention to you guys, you watch when a baby's born, and a baby is born so beautiful, man, and they're ugly. They're pink and white and bloody, but they're beautiful. And you look at that beauty, and you go, how beautiful is this child? And I love my children so much. While the other is in the room going, I'm going to destroy that beauty one day. I'm going to ruin that. I'm going to set forth a plan, everything I can do to destroy that child's life. And that's the enemy. He looks at the reborn, the set free, the born again. And he says, yeah, you're made beautiful, but I will do everything I can to destroy that and ruin that beauty. He's all about ruining that. And when, as we as Christian men, we start to think about these things, man, we have to start to evaluate the decisions we're making in our lives we have to start to evaluate the things that are pressing against our minds. Because when you start to notice these things being such a distraction, causing so much dissension for you, you have to realize that you're being a victim of the enemy trying to destroy and ruin what God has made beautiful in you. And I know beautiful is weird. A bunch of, we're a bunch of men and it's not real. You want to say we're beautiful. But I hate to tell you guys, you are beautiful. <laughs> God has made you beautiful. Okay. No, I'm being real. All right. <laughs> God has made you beautiful. We are children of God, man. That ain't going to change. Okay, don't be all hard man about it. But you see, every single one of us in this room, man, are just the enemy constantly trying to destroy that through lust, through pride, through self-interest, through all these different things, man, to get us away from walking that path that God has set to, to have us be holy as he was holy. And so we're reading about Saul. This dude at one time who was so humble for a moment. Remember, back when he was, back when he was selected, man. Yeah, it said that, uh, Saul said, Am not I a, a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all Israel? Of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Saul started off, man, as a normal guy. He started off as a guy who was humble. He started off as somebody who was like, man, what? You remember when they were looking for him to anoint him? Where was he? He was hiding in the bushes or whatever, man. He was a guy like you and I, who at, at some point in our lives, in our relationship with God, we, we find ourselves just humble. You know, someone comes to you and says, man, you got to share your testimony more often. No, man, not me. I don't really got much to offer. Or man, you got to share that word of encouragement that you have. Or God has put an anointing on your life. I could tell. I could, when you speak forth his word, it ministers to me. And you just go, no, man, this can't be me. There's no way. Saul was the same guy. And as we look, I wanted to take this back a little bit. Uh, not, not so far, but it, I'm just going to bust through certain scriptures of 1 Samuel. Uh, and chapter 13 is where you see Saul make his first mistake. It says, and Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. It came to pass that as soon as he had made an offering, the end of offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. You see, Samuel at this time uh, had told Saul, I'll be there in a short time. But Saul was already very quickly. We saw his character. Very quickly, his flesh began to resurface. <clears throat> he became impatient. He was given orders and instructions by Samuel, but he started to grow impatient. So, you know, it's real interesting to see how quick the flesh wants to resurface. We're born again. We're humble guys. 
We know that we're nothing before the Lord. But then all of a sudden, you start to feel that flesh just waiting to burst out. Waiting to just take its place. Gosh, I don't know how, how often, especially working in the church, how often you see people dealing with this very issue, just trying to maintain that flesh, that which wants to come out, that natural thing that wants to shoot out of us. But the result of this, verse 14, he says in 13, chapter 13, but now the kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord commanded him to be captain over his people because Thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. See, immediately God began to speak to Saul and tell him, because of your disobedience, man, because you couldn't maintain, because you got, you got prideful. And we, as we read for Samuel, it happened fast. Really, it did. Saul's anointing and then watching him become the, getting the kingdom stripped from him, it happened quick. It didn't take long. And as we all know in this room, it doesn't take long for that flesh to, to come out and become that which it wants to be. It can happen for some of us overnight. You can just explode on your wife out of nowhere. You can just, you can just do something that really can mess you up. And it happens quick when that flesh begins to come out. So look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. It says in verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And now I'm just going to kind of buzz through. Verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth mean the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? You guys remember, he was supposed to destroy all of the enemy, but he kept things. You see, it kept, he kept coming to the same result. First, he grew impatient. Second, he grew disobedient. And verse 19 says, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel's trying to tell him, Look, man, you had an opportunity here to obey God. What are you thinking? What are you doing? You weren't supposed to take the spoil. You were supposed to kill it all. See, but Saul got caught up in the compromise part of things, thinking that it was okay to do some things, but not the other. It was okay to go halfway. It was okay to give, give half victory. And then, okay, I'll listen to God on this part, Saul was saying. I'll listen to him on this side. I'll destroy this, but I'm going to keep that too. You see, all of these things are, are attributes that we have to really listen to. Because these are things that we'll, we'll, well, we will find in our everyday lives. You start walking with the Lord, you make a couple mistakes, then you make a couple more. And you start to see, well, maybe I could do some of this. I'll do half of this. Maybe I know the Lord's speaking to me and he's wanting me to do certain things, but, you know, I'll just give him part of this. But this other part I'm going to keep. This other part I'll, I'll keep for myself. Compromise. Compromise quickly enters in. And it's kind of like you sit back and you go, God looks at you and says, didn't, didn't I call you to do this 100%? Kill the enemy. Kill the flesh. So verse 22 says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as delight, and this was a key verse here, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice? As in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken the, the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. <clears throat> See, Saul became rebellious. He became stubborn. He felt that by the works that he was doing, he would be able to sort of drown what God was really wanting him to do. And it's easy to get caught up in this, guys. It's easy to get caught up into thinking that by how much we do will sort of cloud what God is, what, what we know we should be obeying. And that's a very wicked place to become. It's a, it's a very dangerous trap to fall in. Into thinking that the more I give to God, then I know God's wanting me to do this. I know he's wanting me to get rid of this one thing in my life. But the more I do, the more I go to church, the more I read my Bible, maybe he'll see that first more. See, Saul's, one of Saul's greatest failures was thinking that he can sacrifice to God rather than obey. And it's very common throughout the pattern of Scripture from the beginning of creation to see that people get caught up into thinking that you can just sacrifice your way to God. That you can work your way to God. That you can start just achieving and performing for God rather than obeying the one thing that He's wanting you to do first. 
I believe it was these series of things when God stood back and he looked down. He already declared it. And he said, this, this guy's lost it. I warned the people of Israel. I told them when they get this king, he's going to be, he's going to get weird. He's going to get caught up. But they still wanted him. God wanted to show his people as they turned towards their king, Saul. He wanted to show them, as you look to this man, and as you try to follow after this man rather than follow after me, you will see that this man will fail you. Because men are failures. He wanted to show his people, Israel, that you have chosen this man over me. There's something about the lesson of Saul that we all really have to take in. There's so, there's so many lessons in, in the life of Saul that we can take in. But most importantly, we see a man who was anointed by God. I mean, to be anointed by God, to have his finger touch your life and anoint you, to set you apart, to make you sanctified, to set you free, to be the chosen person, to be a chosen person of God. I think a lot of us in this room are aware that you are anointed of God. You've been selected. You've been chosen. God has placed his Holy Spirit in you. He has, he has delivered you and set you free from your sin. But one of the greatest areas of debate that we have today that exists in the church is, well, if I'm anointed of God, then I can just live however I want, and I guess I'll die a good man. Or, as the Bible teaches and as we read about Saul, the question is, if I'm anointed of God, if I'm selected and chosen of God, what would my sin do to me? What would compromise do to me? If I continue to walk in disobedience to God, what can happen to me? See, guys, it's very easy to get comfortable with saying, well, God has picked me. I already know that. I don't have to do anything. I'll die and I'll go to heaven. I, that would be the nice road to take. The difficult and the challenging path to walk on is the one that says, God has selected me, and now I get to choose to either live a life of holiness, pursuing after him. I get to live a life of pursuing after his commandments that he's given to me, or I don't. Every single one of us, I always say this all the time, we know what God is asking us to do. It's not a mystery. I bet you if we went around this whole room and asked, Has, have you heard from the Lord to obey something, every single one of us should be able to say something in response to that. We should be able to say, actually, right now, I know the Lord has wanted me to do this. Whatever it is. It may not be this major, serious, huge thing, but it could be something that God is asking you to do. The scripture tonight warns you that if you do not do that, you could find yourself going a downward spiral, down and down into further compromise, into a place where now you become like Saul, somebody who was just striving. Gosh, you know you're striving when you feel just exhausted serving God. I don't know about you guys. I mean, how many of us in here just feel so exhausted serving God? Yeah, you're exhausted because you're the one doing all the work. See, that's just real simple. It's, it, it, he doesn't want you to do all the work. It, it's, not, it's not for you to do all the work. Oh, I saved you. Good luck. That's not what he says. He says, just obey me. Because what he's going to ask for you to obey him is not going to be exhausting. It might be challenging. It might be challenging. It's challenging sometimes to obey the Lord. It could be anything. It could be food. Oh, man. That's a challenge. Calorie counting. <clears throat> Forget it, man. I'm trying to calorie count. It's ridiculous. You know, it's like food is the thing. It could be challenging. Challenging to obey the Lord. And whatever it is. On a real level, it gets difficult. In marriage, with kids, the challenge to be a father, that's difficult. I ain't even going to lie. The challenge to be a husband that's doing right, that's seeking after the Lord. I know that, man. The challenge is just try to make God happy by what we do. It could be a challenge. But if you're doing what he's saying to obey to do, you're making him happy. And so now we come to this scenario Finishing 1 Samuel, not clueless to how Saul got to this point. You see, it was meant that Saul, in the beginning, would be a good king. He would obey God. He would reign over Israel. He would lead God's people. But because of sin, compromise, and disobedience, his life ended this way. His sons were dead, murdered, and war. I mean, 
Jonathan, who David loved, man. This was his buddy. This was his, his, his brother, his soldier, dead. See, it's very sad to think that it could be possible for someone selected by God to die this way. Now, let me touch on something. Is Saul in heaven or is he in hell? Well, <clears throat> I'm not even going to try to answer that. <laughs> I have my own personal beliefs. I think he's in heaven. Because Samuel said, this day, tomorrow, you'll be with me. And I believe Samuel was in heaven. <laughs> but that's just my own little quick verse on that. But the fact of the matter is, was Saul supposed to end this way? No. No. You see, this is where we can get in and start dictating. Now, I don't want to get weird. I'm not trying to get Calvinist on this or nothing. I'm, trying to, I'm not going to get you know, weird about this. But, <laughs> but the point is, guys is we do have a choice in how we live our life. It's, it's real simple. You take care of yourself, you're a healthy guy, you might live a little longer than if you just ate hot dogs and Cheetos all your life. I mean, I can break down some medical reasons of that. And I know at the end of the day, God chooses our destiny. He, he, he knows the last day that we're gonna be alive. But let me just get real here for a second. You treat your wife nicely, she's gonna be glad. Right? You treat your, you raise your kids right for a time, <laughs> they'll be all right. And then they get to choose, you know. See, to everything that we do, there's, there's something that follows that. And it's the same with our walk with God. Guys, we can't just, we can't just come to Bible study and read his word and then leave and, and live completely opposite to what we're learning. We can't, just, we can't just come to church and fellowship in groups like we do and pray and then go on out about our lives in the world and think that, Oh, we can just continue to live in disobedience and we'll be all right. I hate to break it to you guys tonight, but if you do that, then you're going you're gonna to see things happen in your life that aren't really supposed to be there. God doesn't want evil for our lives. And, I, and it's funny because a lot of people think, oh man, God, once I become Christian, he's just going to send lightning bolts to my life for the rest of my life. No, that's not true. I challenge anybody in here who's going through a trial to examine if it was self-inflicted or not. You see, sometimes we reap to what we sow, brothers. Let's not get weird about that, <clears throat> okay? I mean, you make decisions that are sinful, you might have to, that might, the results are gonna follow you in your life. It's just like you get a girl pregnant, and she's gonna have a kid, that's your kid for the rest of your life. You know, it's what we do shows. I mean, we, we, we have a choice. It wasn't meant that Saul was to die a, a king falling on his own sword. I mean, what is that? This was God's anointed, God's chosen king, God's chosen man. My point in these first few verses really is just to say to us, man, let's be accountable to what we do. We have to be accountable in our walk with God. We don't have to, we don't walk around with our hands up saying, oh, I can just do whatever. No, guys, God is asking things of us. He's asking for your obedience. He's not asking for your sacrifice. He's asking for you just to listen to his voice and to respond to it. He wants to see you make a decision that he's asking you to do, not one that you think is easiest. He's just saying, obey my voice and you will see his hand move in your life. But some of us in here just said that doesn't click. We're still thinking we can reject that voice and do other things. And it came to pass on the morrow, verse 8, <clears throat> chapter 31. When the Philistines, they came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor. And they sent him into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. This is where we start to ask ourselves, do you think this was God's will? Was it God's will that his chosen king would get his head cut off and then it would be bragged among the enemy that he was killed? We have to remember, man, those choices that we make, even though they feel good for a time, they're gonna end in a very humiliating way. 
The enemy's objective in anything that he's asking you to do, and please let this ring in your head if you're in this position right now. If you're messing around with compromise, or if you're choosing to disobey what God's word is telling you to do what is right, you can be sure that the enemy will cut your head off and rub it in and laugh at you when you're done. Never get deceived into thinking that this little compromise that, oh, it's okay for a time. Because sometimes it seems like it can fly for a little bit. Sin seems fun for a season. That's what Pastor Jeff always says, what everybody says. Sin is fun for a season. But once you see that, once you see it begin to take root, once you see it begin to grow, you see the evil and dark behind it. You're not fooling anybody. God sees what we do. We can't fool him. He sees what we mess around with. And this is something that I, I, the enemy is very tricky and clever about deceiving Christians and thinking, well, one little time is not going to kill anybody. Whatever. Nobody's here anyway. None of your brothers from church are going to see you. Your wife's not here. Your wife's asleep. Oh, who cares, man? Everybody does it. You see, this is where, where the enemy begins to get tricky. It starts to work on your mind and to cause us to think that, well, the little bit of compromise that we get into, it's okay, you know, because God's going to forgive you the first time, second time, third time, and then you get into God, forgive me for all eternity, and you just find yourself walking now slowly down on road of compromise because the enemy has got in your mind thinking that there is going to be no result to this. But Saul's compromise and his disobedience ended with his head being cut off and he's tied being dragged around in the enemy territory. If we need a picture, if anybody is in there asking, <clears throat> well, Lord, what's going to happen if I keep doing this? I'm not saying no one's going to go cut your head off and drag you around with a car around the city. Point is, what's going to happen if you continue to reject God's voice and think that you can live in compromise? You will be humiliated. The enemy will laugh at you. And as we learned, whether it was last week or a couple weeks ago, he will kick you when you're down. He doesn't hold back. His objective is to, find, to finish it. Go for the kill. And so look, and they put his armor in the house of Ashtoreth. And they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. See, now, they're not just humiliating Saul, they're humiliating his God. It's very sad, man, when Christians begin to blow their witness. And I, I, I don't use that as Christi Christianese type language either. I mean, it's very, very unfortunate when we know someone who's serving after God or serving the Lord, and they're just blowing a witness left and right. They're on Facebook taking beers back, and they're at church with their arms worshiping the Lord. And I mean, it's, I'm not saying I've seen anybody in here on Facebook drinking beers, but what I'm saying is you find that when you see somebody who has this, this identified, this stamp that they're with the Lord, and, and they're serving God, and they're worshiping Him, and then all of a sudden you see their life living the opposite, you're not, you're not just humiliating yourself. You're, 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 you're saying, oh, to those that are around you that know you, who's your God? You mean your God lets you do that, huh? Oh, I want that one then. I'm good with that God. Which God is yours? He's the one that lets me just do kind of whatever I want on the weekends? Come on, guys. I think every one of us in this room know that that's not cool. I think everyone in this room would know, you know what? No, I can't, I can't live a double life. Because I'm not, just, I'm not just bringing myself down. I'm not, and not, not that you're bringing God down from heaven, but you know what? Those who were looking at you around you, seeing that your life was changed, seeing that you were a new creation, are looking at you going, what happened? I, I thought there was some power behind it, but it looks like, oh, that was just all up front. It's very sad, man. But how many of us have been there? How many of us know? How many of us know guys this way? How many of us ourselves were there at one time? Well, you end up in your room going, Lord, forgive me, man. What am I doing? I'm just misrepresenting you, Lord, left and right. <clears throat> and look at this ending here. It's kind of weird. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bashan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Jabesh Gilead is an interesting group of people there. Do you guys remember their story? <clears throat> and it's real interesting because you guys know that Saul was a Benjamite. Over in the book of Judges, there's this really interesting story dealing with the Benjamites and Jabesh Gilead. 
they were both sort of the rejects of Israel at one time. Israel had went to uh, handle some business at Mizpah, and the only people that didn't show up were the uh, Jabesh Gilead. They were going to go and attack all the Benjamites. Really interesting when you start looking into this, this story. See, Saul was a Benjamite. Saul was from these people that Israel went and wiped out. Because they were the ones who, you guys remember the story of that, that concubine, they chopped her up, they, or they raped her all night long. I don't know if you remember that story in Judges. They were the Benjamites who did that. And Israel was like, what? No way, man. These guys ain't going to do that. We're going to go kill them. Benjamin. So they went, they wiped Benjamin out, and then all of a sudden Israel felt bad for doing what they did. They go, oh man, we killed our brother, Benjamin, man. Israel shouldn't be attacking each other. What are we going to do? Now we've wiped out a tribe of Israel. They were all worried about it after they went and killed them all. They felt bad. So they said, well, here's what we got to do then in order to kind of say I'm sorry to our brother Benjamin. Let's go get them some wives. That way they can continue on their, their, gene, their lives and have kids. Hmm. Well, where should we go? Well, let's go to Jabesh Gilead and wipe all those guys out, take all their wives, and we'll give them to the Benjamites. That's what they did. This is in the book of Judges. You can read about it. Saul was a Benjamite, and this Jabesh Gilead really, at, at one time, was, <laughs> was done really, really wrong. But it's really weird to see both of these people involved here at the end of Saul's life. It's really, and I'm not getting too weird on following the whole lineage. But there's always meaning behind everything in the scripture. You know, Saul, being a Benjamite, kind of a off, kind of a, a on the side tribe, Jabesh Gilead being done wrong. And you see these two people intervene here in a time when Saul, the chosen king of Israel, had done wrong as well. You know, I every time I read about scriptures, and I wish tonight we can go into 2 Samuel first one and just start hitting some major points. But we're gonna end first Samuel on a really kind of like a, a negative beat, you know. You have all this wrong going on. You have all this sadness at play. You have all this kind of just, this, these, these symbols here of Jabesh Gilead and Benjamin and remembering this horrible time of Israel. This king chosen by God who has done wrong in his life, dies, gets his heads cut off. His son who was innocent, who was right before the Lord, dies. They're all just dead. Everybody's on the negative here. What is God doing? You know, what, is there something wrong with God's plan here? You see, and that's the question we ask when we read stories like this. Did God make a mistake somewhere? Because everything is bad up to this point. Everybody mentioned here is negative up to this point. We have nothing positive to look at here. You see, but we know what's going on on the outside. We know what's happening in the background. God is setting a stage. It's like when we first opened 1 Samuel. It's for when we first got into it. You guys remember it said the word of the Lord was scarce in those days. When we first got into the book of Samuel, we found God, he was far from it. And we end Samuel by looking like God is far from it again. Interesting how God comes in and very closely we see his handiwork. We see his hand involved in the lives of his people. And then oftentimes it seems like he's no longer there. Like he's gone. Like he's not involved. Our lives are a roller coaster like this, man. Sometimes it seems like we're so close to the Lord, and then oftentimes it seems like we're so far from Him. We want Him to draw near to us, and then when He does, it just seems like nothing but darkness is revealed. I'm not going to end on that note. But I will end by saying this. God's plan is very much providential and active in every single one of our lives. And though sometimes it seems like we come to these negative slumps in our Christian walk, we have to know that there is brightness. There is the sun rising on the other side. And I think for every one of us in this room, as we read 2 Samuel and we get into it, we're going to see God's plan at work. We're going to see him and the man after his own heart and what he does with him. But we don't even have to go there to understand this much. If we are at a downer point in our lives, if we are walking through that valley of the shadow of death, we know that that person walking through that valley of the shadow of death came out of it. We know that if we're at a down point, we're at a negative, we're at a convicting time in our Christian walk, we're at a failing time in our walk, we know that we've been forgiven. We know that because the story of creation doesn't end with Satan having his way. The story of creation ends with God sending a savior. God sending someone to intervene for us. Don't be surprised by the negative, by the downer times, by the bummer times in your Christian walk. It's a part of life. Solomon wrote it. 
Everything's meaningless, man. Everything's meaningless under the sun. A time for war, a time for peace. Guys, there's a time, there's a time to be bummed out and there's a time to joy. There's a time to feel like, a, like you're just losing it, like you're losing control of your walk with the Lord or like nothing's happening with your walk with the Lord, like you're at a stale point actually. And then there's a time where you feel real active and everything's happening and everything's alive in your walk. We cannot allow for these ups and downs in our Christian walk to dictate who God is to us. He doesn't change. He has a plan here. And we're going to get into it next time. And we're going to see it unfold. As we will, all of us, and some of us are in the dark time. Some of us have come out of it. But you see God's plan in your life. He's not done. He has a calling on your life. If he's anointed your life, he has purpose for your life. Just because you're going like this, he's not done. Don't let this part of your walk Decide who God is. He doesn't change. His offer is there to every single one of us tonight. Are you going to obey me? It's as simple as that. If anything you learn from this man, Saul, learn this much. Just obey God. Don't work your way to him. Don't strive your way to him. Don't start trying to perfect in the flesh what he started in the spirit in your life. Surrender your life to him. Continually surrender to him. Obey his voice. And you will see, and we will see that spiritual revival take place in our lives. Get out of the rut. You don't have to be there. Move forward. Steady on. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for just being able to see a life like Saul's and Lord, to watch a, a man who made a lot of decisions, a lot just to really see what it is to see ourselves in Saul. Really is to see how we can be as Saul. But Lord, we ask now, as we are all still here, Lord, that you would speak to us clearly. And that some of us in here, we know what you're saying to do. Help us now, Lord, empower us to make the decision to say, to choose right, to choose to obey, to listen to what you're asking. Because Lord, we don't want to go down that road even darker. We don't want to end up down a road of disobedience. So, Lord, intervene now for our lives, we pray. Speak loudly and clearly, Lord, to us that, that need to just hear you. Stop us if we're moving to the right or to the left. Bring us back to that straight road. But, Lord, we thank you for your word because it empowers us. It teaches us, Lord, just the realities of life. We go before the rest of our night, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we... Uh, we haven't uh, done this in a while, but why don't we just for just a couple minutes just pray individually right where we're at.